So, uh, hello everyone and welcome to the last conference of this year's Economics Week. Uh, I'll be hosting this conference uh, along with my colleague Patricia. Uh, and today we have with us Professor Anna from Birmingham Business School uh, to discuss the topic uh, of this afternoon's conference, which is uh, financialization and how it may generate social and economic inequity uh, with special focus uh, on within rich countries. Um, some of Professor Anna's areas of expertise are, among others, uh, income and wealth inequality, uh, finance, eco financial economics, and institutional economics. Uh, and she is also an active promoter of pluralism and inclusivity uh, in economics. Uh, please let me know if anything is incorrect or if you'd like to complement it with something else. Um, if not, we can just go along with the questions. No, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm very glad to be here. Perfect. Uh, so to begin with, um, you, you prepared the slide presentation, so I'll just start with the first question. Uh, so I would like you to start with a brief introduction, uh, if you could, uh, to the topic of financialization uh, and, and in today's society, as well as the main role it plays. Certainly. So thank you once again uh, uh, for inviting me to speak on this topic. I think it's very um, interesting to talk about this idea of financialization in the present day and age in, in, you know, in the context of the pandemic, because um, just before I kind of get into the, the nitty gritty of the, of the concept, what it stands for, um, of course, like research in economics and any, any social science, any, I guess in any science in general, it follows certain waves. So I'd say that, you know, at the time of the global financial crisis um, in 2007, this idea of financialization really gained um, a lot of interest among economists and other social scientists. Um, and, you know, it's interesting to look at it now, and I hope that I'll be able to shed some light on the relevance of this concept and like, what it represents in the context of the pandemic. So, um, you know, I hope that by the end you will see that uh, it is still a very much relevant process, even though the, the perhaps the way it manifests itself is quite different than what uh, perhaps a lot of the researchers of financialization studied um, with a particular focus on the kind of period since the 1980s, but we're going to get to that. So the, uh, the concept of financialization is quite an interesting one because it's, it's kind of very intuitive. So I'm, I'm sure that if I say financialization, you kind of get what it is, but at the same time, it's so broad that it's it almost became like a catch-all term for different processes that perhaps, you know, in itself could be an object of a lifelong study. Um, so for example, over here, I am presenting some of the uh, definitions that uh, have been pulled from different uh, sources. Uh, some of them are from uh, sociologists, so Greta Krippner is a sociologist. Um, some of them are from economists, so Edward, uh, Gerald Epstein, so Gerald Epstein uh, is an economist. Uh, and then some of them are from uh, economic geographers, so Karen Lai is, uh, is representing that field. So you can see that from a variety of different disciplines, uh, we can get uh, some idea of what the kind of underlying um, concerns or processes are. So the, the kind of sociologist definition uh, talks about the patterns of accumulation in our economies, uh, which uh, is focused on firms making profits more and more uh, through uh, financial investment rather than by trading with other firms or by producing things. So the first kind of ways in which we can look at financialization relates to the, um, you know, where profits in an economy comes from, where the kind of, you know, the, the main bulk of economic activity comes from. The more kind of economics definitions are those related to uh, perhaps corporate governance or man critical management, uh, focus on the, the way that firms operate. So not just what they do, but how they do it. And uh, the main concept within that is this concept of shareholder value being the, the desire of firms to um, appease or placate their shareholders 
by pursuing the type of investments that would get them more short term profit, which coincidentally would also be financial investment, uh, rather than pursuing more long term investment projects that are less immediate in terms of the payoff that the shareholders get. And related to that is again this more specific view on where investment comes from. So while the sociologists talk more generally about the patterns of accumulation through financial channels rather than through production, um, the economists talk more specifically about firms being more involved in capital markets, so raising funds for investment through capital markets rather than from uh, commercial banks. And that will come in quite handy when we talk about inequality in, in, in another question. And then, of course, it links to more general processes of power and the increasing power of the, the rentier class or the capitalist class, which again links very strongly to the processes of inequality that we're going to be talking about today. Um, and then, more specifically, it refers, it is often used to refer to a very specific period of time in the past. Uh, century uh, that refers to the explosion of financial trading, the emergence of new financial instruments that have not been seen before. And because, as you see, this concept is very broad, um, there, uh, there have been some attempts uh, by Epstein and Lai uh, that you can see at the bottom of the slide here to try to generalize the definition of financialization. So in the very famous definition, uh, Gerald Epstein says that Financialization is about the, the increasing role of financial motives, financial markets, actors, and financial institutions at the core of how our economies operate nowadays. And um, the geo economic geographers uh, link it even with the way that individuals make decisions. So they talk about how individual aspirations, individual behavior is increasingly influenced to the financial logics and the financial structures. So to kind of summarize these different concepts, what we mean, some of the dimensions of financialization link to the way firms operate, how firms operate, so how they finance their investment, how they behave, so what are the priorities of, of firms um, you know, as a, a motor of economic activity. Um, it relates also to the processes of new financial innovations, and related to that, certain economic policy measures that facilitated these changes. Uh, and then, of course, at the back of that, we have the processes of deepening inequality. And then last but not least, the, um, you know, the financialization in the everyday, uh, everyday life. So uh, this is kind of the, the broad uh, overview of what the concept of financialization stands for. And then I think in the few next questions, we're going to talk more specifically about the impacts and effects it has. Yes, yes. Uh, I think you just mentioned a few uh, very important things, and uh, my next questions, uh, my, ne my ne sorry, my next question is: uh, What are the biggest issues at stake uh, in what regards financialization? I, you mentioned um, th that firms make profit by investment, then by trading their product, or maybe the sh the shareholder value uh, is becoming increasingly important because the short term. Uh, is the main focus instead of the long term. Uh, but what would would you say is the biggest issues we face right now? Certainly. So I'm going to start with the uh, kind of the, uh, you know, again, before I go into the specific issues, I just wanted to uh, again highlight, because before we move on to the specific issues, one, one thing that's actually, I think, often misconceived about financialization is, you know, what, what actually what period of time and what countries or which group of countries does it describe? And while today we're going to be, of course, talking about high income countries or rich countries, um, it is very much a process that, you know, and again, you know, sociologists and economists and historians have said, you know, has taken place for, you know, even thousands of years. So, you know, this idea of financialization as a kind of the greater dominance of credit and finance in everyday life. It's not something that's just um, 
emerged, you know, in the past few decades. Um, and essentially, you know, it is, uh, we, we can talk about different phases of financialization, perhaps. Um, and what we're going to be talking, what I'm going to be talking about uh, for the rest of today's uh, presentation is what you can call either the modern phase of financialization or what in my own work I called more specifically the financial sector transformation that refers specifically to what's been going on in the 20th century, especially since the um, started already the 1960s, but gained steam really throughout the 1990s um, and uh, even a bit earlier in the 80s and the early 2000s. And that again was facilitated by, uh, you know, by specific policy measures. And so coming now to the kind of what's at stake here, um, from the point of view of economy as a whole or the global economy or even individual ec economies, is that the there are certain processes that have been observed very vividly by different economists here i'm giving specific examples of school of thought uh, from um, uh, kalecki and economics from the polish economist michael kalecki and the post keynesian economist um, who have very explicitly studied the first of all the rising unprecedented uh, rise in inequality uh, over the past decades i'm saying unprecedented in the modern times, of course, not historically, but nevertheless, since you know, since the um, post-war era, unprecedented rise of inequality. On the one hand, while at the same time in high-income countries, um, we observe this trend of uh, secular stagnation, or what simply means that countries uh, expand at a very slow pace, so they don't experience very high rates of economic growth, which can then, you know, translate into people not being able to get, uh, you know, enough employment or income, or you know, innovation taking place as well. Even though, you know, you can again argue there's nuance to that, but in general, this has been kind of the two broad trends that economists have observed, and unsurprisingly, you there has been work that linked these processes directly to these different dimensions of financialization that we have uh, already discussed. So for example, the what is called the financialization of non-financial firms or non-financial corporations uh, points out how the fact that firms, rather than produce goods and services, uh, they prefer to in take those funds and invest them in financial markets, how that, first of all, constrains employment creation, which therefore constrains, you know, how much income, let's say, more regular people are able to get, compared to how much uh, profits um, those who are, let's say, privileged enough to own shares of companies, which um, I don't know about you, but I personally know very few people who own shares of any company. So, you know, this is very much the domain of those towards the, you know, the top of the distribution. Um, and therefore, the process of inequality, first of all, increases. And secondly, because there is not that push for employment and therefore, um, you know, demand creation in the economy, that also slows down that economic growth, which, which can, you know, explain how these dimensions of financialization relate to these big challenges that we observe uh, for, for high income countries these days. And then, of course, another crucial uh, area of research, which, to be honest, is quite underexplored. I think a lot of the research of financialization focuses on the corporations um, and less of that focuses on the government and the role of the state and how the, the process of financialization also impacted on the way that the, the economic policy is conducted. And that, of course, is a great facilitator of all of these processes and dimensions and financializations. And the specific uh, kind of types of policies that I'm talking about here relate to the, the, the kind of re retrenchment or withdrawal of the state from the uh, from from the economy to the minimum of facilitating those market processes. So rather than um, you know the state, let's say, creating employment directly, it would rather give let's say a tax break to a, a large corporation in the hope that it would then create employment itself. 
So there is this um, view that the market or the private market is better at organizing our economic life, and therefore the role of the state should be under financialization to actively promote the market and not to intervene too much in the way that markets work. And uh, basically, you know, again, all of that kind of when we when we talk about financialization, all of that kind of links together to explain how these different aspects of financialization actually uh, can explain some of these great challenges that we face today, i.e. income and wealth inequality, and this kind of sluggish rates of, of growth and um, innovation and progress that we observe in high income countries, of course, with the caveat the COVID vaccine is a great example of innovation, but you know it's uh, it's been very recent process. This type of work that we're looking now, um, it talks about the period you know roughly since the 1980s, you know up until very recently. You can you can go along with the, the presentation. Uh, you you finished the the introduction uh, or um, you you want to start talking about because here you mentioned. A big, the biggest issue, I would say, which is widening of income inequality. And uh, for you, which were um, the, the recent events in economic history that might lead us, lead us to uh, be where we are now with widening income inequality? Mm -hmm. Certainly. So let me just check because I don't remember the SI. Perfect. I, I think I had your questions at the back of my mind when I was compiling this. So before we move on to before I move on to kind of talk about the specific processes um, of inequality in terms of how they play out, of course, as with any kind of economic process or concepts, uh, there are different. There's like a you know a range of different explanations in terms of how we can ex how we can understand this concept. And um, typically, when it comes to inequality, typically. Um, the the theories in, in economics tend to focus on uh, more kind of um, individual level uh, factors individual level meaning pertaining to differences between individuals for example differences in education differences in age uh, differences in in skills and how um, you know the changing structures in the economy alter you know what type of skills are in demand and what are not and so it's very much a, a, about you know what individuals should do or can do or how the policy can help individuals to improve their own kind of standing relative to the rest of the economy however with this advent of financialization and of course uh, we have a large part of research before that whole you know uh, literature and financialization started that emphasizes this issue but particularly i think when since our topic is financialization and inequality you know i think particularly with that rise of financialization this idea of inequality being not just down to the individual characteristics or individual preferences but rather inequality being determined by something that's outside of the individual's control and uh, and this what this is what we call this structural factors or structural inequalities which basically are the type of um, origins or determinants of inequality that relate to the way that the economy is organized, the way that the economy operates. And um, of course, there was this very famous work uh, by Thomas Piketty that kind of again catalyzed this uh, these debates, uh, you know, brought income and wealth inequality to the forefront of, of our attention. Um, is that, you know, first of all, we need to distinguish between, you know, what type of inequality are we talking about? And it's important to look at not just differences in earnings, which is often the, you know, the has been typically the main object of the study of inequality earnings and, you know, how differences, let's say, in education influence earnings and so on. Um, but we need to look more broadly at different types of income and also at wealth, which has its own kind of, it's its own distinct concept and um, in my own work i argued that you know in in the context of financialization uh, we definitely need to learn more about wealth inequality because uh, it's actually uh, you would be surprised but it is actually fairly underexplored um, in the in the broader literature and you know when we talk we're not talking today about uh, developing countries but when we want to even when we look at what's going on in high income countries, you know, the, 
the push towards globalization is very much, you know, one um, factor again that, you know, it is outside of the individual's control, whether let's say a company um, relocates uh, its production line to China, right? It's outside of the worker's control. So even, you know, with good skills, with good education, these processes that are taking place at the level of the economy or even the global economy as a whole uh, play a very crucial role. And therefore that creates challenge in terms of how policy can effectively address inequality, which I think we're gonna talk about towards the end. And of course, when it comes to financialization, um, something that's you know very, um, very, uh, yeah, I think this is, uh, not as relevant, but something that is very important um, to, uh, to understand as a determinant of inequality is precisely these processes of financialization that we have already talked about. So kind of pulling everything together, the kind of the main way that um, I see those inequalities being uh, produced by these processes of financialization is the following. So on the one hand, um, we had that big push for financial deregulation, the rise of new financial in instruments, this process of debt securitization, which basically refers to um, the financial institution being able to make more money off loans to households. So typically, you know, financial uh, commercial banks, they make money by um, charging higher interests to people who borrow money from the bank compared to how much commercial banks pay to those who deposit the money uh, with the bank. Uh, however, with that advent of new financial products, um, actually commercial banks found that they can earn even more by making new types of financial instruments based on the loans that they make, especially to households, and earn much higher profit from this kind of transaction. So on the one hand, it became very profitable for the uh, financial sector to start to engage in a lot of lending to groups of people, especially households um, that are have previously been denied access to that credit. And on the other hand, looking more broadly at the, the, the economy and what's going on with policy. I mentioned already that re, re withdrawal of the state from, uh, from the economic life to facilitate market processes. And this is precisely uh, has in many and many advanced countries has translated into policies that uh, aimed to made, make labor markets more flexible or more liberalized meaning to withdraw uh, support for, let's say, you know, minimum wage or work, worker unionization and so on, to make it easier basically to hire and fire uh, people in the labor market. And that led to a, overall a reduction in, in, a, in real wages over time and a much slower growth of real wages over time. And at the same time, this withdrawal of the state, so the financialization of the state, so to speak, has been associated with rising costs of services such as uh, pension, healthcare, education, because these services that typically had been provided by the state have been increasingly privatized, i.e. provided by um, private firms, which typically is associated with higher costs than the government. And so what we observe is that these different processes led to a kind of a common phenomenon that on the one hand, there was a greater supply of the desire to supply debt and credit by those financial institutions who could earn a greater profit. And on the other hand, there was a greater demand for credit uh, by households who suddenly, you know, not, not only found that their earnings were, uh, you know, declining or were growing at a slower pace, then their costs of living were increasing. And so the key uh, kind of dynamic that, um, as I mentioned already, you know, wealth uh, that really becomes crucial for how we understand um, inequality to arise in this time of modern financialization is that depending on what your circumstances are, depending what your job are, what your race, your gender, your social class, um, you will find yourself with the ability to accumulate different type of, of assets to then earn a certain type of income and to access different types of debt. So typically those that were uh, richer on a better position, they can 
uh, access that credit and purchase assets that are more profitable for them, like you know, financial assets, for example. And also they can access credit, but that credit is um, more, more easy to repay, first of all, because they have typically higher incomes and higher wealth, but also because typically the, um, the, the kind of the more credit worthy you are, which is typically, you know, the higher your income, the more credit worthy you are, then the lower um, interest rate you'd face for your, uh, for your debt. Conversely, those that, uh, you know, that were especially targeted by by the, by the those uh, new financial institution and those uh, the, that wanted to create those new financial instruments were towards the bottom of the distribution and they don't have the capacity or didn't have the capacity to purchase assets that would give them a lot of income from for example you know if you buy a house you buy a house for yourself you don't buy a house to to rent it to others because you don't even have that basic and you know necessity satisfied of having your own house and therefore, what we observe is that very um, high levels of indebtedness, which then uh, turn, to, uh, turn to very bad uh, consequences for someone once any type of volatility happens. And so when the crisis hit in 2007, um, we, you know, we observed that, yes, uh, while before the crisis in inequality has been rising, during the crisis, income inequality has fallen. Wealth inequality actually continued to increase throughout the crisis because of that unequal access to different types of assets and, and credit. Um, have a small numerical example in a moment, uh, which I can um, pause on or, or just leave it for, for you to ponder. Uh, but over here, I just wanted to very quickly illustrate based on the US data, these processes of you know, increasing inequality across income and wealth um, and that you know increase in uh, wealth that has been very short-lived so on the top left hand side the graph you can see that um, it was the poorest actually that were able to um, expand their asset ownership especially of housing which was the key instrument through which this financial innovation occurred uh, they yes they did expand their home ownership by quite a bit during the the years of the a subprime uh, lending crisis, uh, so some of the expansion, so this process of, um, of financial innovation. But look, by 2016, I believe, they still had very, very low rates of home ownership. So yes, they did increase a lot, but because of the crisis, they faced very high losses. And the losses can be partly understood by the fact that you can see in the bottom left-hand side graph that um, those that are towards the bottom of the distribution actually um, you know whatever assets or income they have it is backed or matched by a uh, very high levels of debt and so you know they, they don't really have that freedom or that capacity to improve their financial well-being in the long term uh, and any type of a volat crisis any type of volatility then leads to very large losses and then this is what you can see on the right hand side with this massive, uh, massive disparities, especially in wealth. You can see that wealth is at the extremes of that graph. And so I hope that this kind of um, convinces you, it shows you that you know, it is really these dynamics of wealth and unequal access to different types of wealth that is really you know, one of the crucial challenges that, uh, that is highlighted by these processes of financialization. Perfect. And uh, given all of this you, you've mentioned uh, about the widening uh, of income inequality, uh, what would you say, and given all the problems mentioned, uh, is the biggest issue that we'll face in the future uh, from current economic and financial behavior uh, in, in, what, uh, in terms of inequality? Absolutely. So let me just skip a few slides just to move to the most relevant um, most relevant aspect. So I think the first, um, the first aspect I think I would like to talk about is the this idea of financial resilience. And I think since we are talking about the the future, and you know, at the beginning I mentioned that you know the process. You you can see that the processes of financialization that I talked about in the context of the the financial crisis that happened more than ten years ago now. Um, is something very specific. It relates to these financial innovations, um, some 
somewhat like exploitations of, of, of you know, households that had previously not been able to accumulate. And once they were able to accumulate, that completely evaporated during the global financial crisis. Um, so you may ask yourself, OK, you know, how is this really relevant for uh, this day and age and in the future? And the way that, you know, I, I think this concept of financialization remains very relevant and remains in a process that we need to still, you know, consider taking seriously is that it highlights this um, crucial idea of financial resilience of, of not just of households, but of, of businesses as of, and of, again, if you look at countries, developing countries, even the entire countries. And what I mean by financial resilience, again, you, we can, you know, we could have another hour probably just talking about this, but very simply speaking is this idea, you know, of how much your income and your, and your assets that you own actually allow you to have a secure uh, life on an everyday basis but also to face any type of shocks and to you know continue building your wealth and your well-being into the future and of course the more indebted you are uh, the the more of that income and assets that you own needs to kind of be you know it belongs to some extent to to the bank because you owe the bank a certain amount of money Every month, you need to repay a part of your from your income, a part of the debt that you owe, and at the same time, uh, from your assets, if your uh, if if let's say how how a house is your only asset, um, and you are not able to repay your debt, then the bank can just step in and repossess your home. So this doesn't really give you that security in terms of you know being able to continue to build your wealth that could bring you closer to the um, you know to the middle or the top of the of the distribution that's one aspect of it and the, the other aspect of it relates to the kind of the not just the kind of what you own and what is your the level of wealth and debt but the kind of the inflows and outflows uh, into your balance sheet so um in the next slide i would i will bring you a more specific example that will hopefully make things clearer but before i go to the specifics um kind of a brief summary of you know what is the issue at stake the issue at stake is that you know on the eve of the COVID pandemic and as we go into the future um actually a lot of households a lot of businesses have been very fragile in terms of this financial resilience so uh, many households um, have not actually even seen the recovery from the 2007 crisis uh, many firms uh, are you know currently with with covid especially small businesses facing um, you know prospects of not being able to operate again and uh, that is not coincidental it's not because covid happened it is because of all of what's been happening before COVID. So the, the type of crisis that we had more than 10 years ago had a very deep impact on um, you know, this, um, this financial resilience of, of different parts of the economy. And then the policy that followed after the global financial crisis hasn't really helped households and businesses rebuild that capacity and rebuild that financial resilience. So uh, when the COVID pandemic hit, um, those that were already in a very fragile situation, uh, you know, their situation became even worse. But, um, you know, it, we cannot, of course, say, oh, what if, you know, what if policy was different? Uh, it, you know, we should look towards the future. But uh, it is definitely what you can say is that the type of policy that was implemented after the, the, the previous crisis hasn't helped really to rebuild that financial resilience for the larger part of the society, which would help you know, not just counteract inequality, but also, you know, improve economic growth and improve the, the resilience of the entire economy to this unprecedented shock that was the COVID pandemic. And so looking into the, the, the future, one thing that, you know, we need to uh, pay very close attention to as we, you know, come out of the COVID pandemic is to scrutinize policy from this point of view how is it tackling this problem of financial resilience for the most vulnerable members of our society and our economy 
And um, there, there has been in particular this economist called Hyman Minsky, which we may or may not have heard about, that really his analysis is a, is a fantastic example of how we can analyze our economy and analyze policy to understand whether it provides that you know, financial resilience to our society. And, uh, and you know, it's, it's, um, it's important for us to, to look, when we look into the future, is to make sure that those that are struggling are indeed uh, helped by the policy that, that ensues. And um, again, we could again talk about, uh, about different responses to the pandemic and how actually they rise up to, to the challenge, but kind of the, um, the situation that we are facing now is that uh, on the one hand, you know, businesses and households are still very much, you know, fragile, they still very much are suffering from not just these decades of this modern financialization we talked about, but also by the by those weak policy responses of the previous crisis, the, the type of employment uh, that uh, many people are able to get has become more and more unstable, meaning that, you know, especially with the in light of COVID, they're perhaps very reliant on the social security system, which in many countries, to be honest, uh, especially countries like the UK and the US, it's very weak in itself. Um, and we haven't, what I haven't talked about uh, for the, the lack of time, but a crucial issue here is that, you know, we're not just talking about poor households, we're talking about households um, and, and people that are discriminated against within the broader economy on account of their, their gender or race, uh, which we really need to, again, pay very close attention to and make sure that any policy um, that addresses these challenges is also very inclusive of these different identities. And what's at stake here in the end, it's not just you know, individuals' well-being, um, it's the you know the the whole well-being uh, or the well-being of the whole economy, so to speak. So you know, um, I'm of the view I'm of the uh, view that uh, um, it is really demand that drives uh, our economic growth. Demands not just from consumers but also from firms, from government, from the rest of the world, uh, rather than the, the the kind of the the production side itself, which is. Um, the demand side has been quite constrained by those uh, neoliberal policies that were implemented. And so when we look into the future, what, what we see is that, again, I'm very passionate about the topic of policy because to me it's, you know, it's how things get done in the economy. So we need that policy, a bold policy change in order to rise up to those challenges of inequality uh, within that context of financialization and financial resilience. Thank you. Uh, so now we just talked about uh, financial resilience and uh, more specifically of uh, agents as individuals. Uh, and, and I would like to change the topic slightly, uh, but discussing uh, the those individuals, uh, agents as individuals, sorry, uh, but more specifically uh, about financial market speculation and the issue it might bring. Uh, and let's focus on for a moment uh, on financial exclusion of uh, some small investors uh, who sometimes fueled by their lack of knowledge uh, in comparison to heavyweight uh, financial agents um, uh, come out weaker uh, because they lack information. And in your opinion, how bad do you think this issue uh, today uh, is? And how bad do you think this issue can get uh, since every day it gets easier the, ac uh, the access uh, to uh, financial instruments that allow speculation um, uh, in this case of financial on agents as individuals? That's a very interesting question. I don't actually have a slide for that, so I'm just gonna uh, leave it here and I'll continue answering. Um, so to start with, uh, as you rightly mentioned, there is very, um, big disparity in terms of the the type of investor we are we are talking about and um you know we can talk about individuals as investors we can talk about institutional investors which of course have a much by institutional investors i mean like pension funds um, hedge funds which very much you know still operate and are doing well um more mostly <laughs> um and of course when it comes to um 
to, you know, why are, let's say, these big institutional investors um, able to invest better or why are uh, certain individuals able to invest uh, better in, in more profitable type of investments than, uh, let's say, those of us who uh, don't have that, uh, you know, that perhaps knowledge as you, or information, as you said. Um, I, I would be personally from my own, uh, my own work, I am quite hesitant to focus too much on differences in information. Um, uh, and the reason is that, um, yes, we can educate people. And of course, you know, it's important for, for us to understand, you know, what, what are the principles of, of uh, investing what are the different risks, uh, payoffs involved? Uh, I don't deny that it's not important. It is very important, and it is a worthwhile, you know, endeavor for individuals and, and individual entrepreneurs and business, small businesses to try to pursue that. But unfortunately, um, I feel just based on my analysis of the kind of discourse that's been going on in, in research and in policy. Um, it's not just about uh, information and providing information is often um, almost like a, a kind of um, an excuse to not look at those deeper structural issues. And, uh, you know, one, one thing is, for example, access to wealth management services, uh, which is, of course, the domain of the, the very rich, right? Even, even I can imagine someone who's fairly well off will not necessarily have access to, uh, to someone who will manage their wealth for them to uh, to ensure that they get you know uh, that their wealth is allocated into these different institutional investments uh, that can then yield them the the greatest uh, the greatest return, and so there is an issue here of size and scale, not just of the size of um, of you know wealth or or prior wealth or or income that you have, but also in the case of firms, for example, or entrepreneurs. Um, the small and medium enterprises are necessarily at a more disadvantaged position because even with the information in hand, they will still be most likely unable to, to benefit to the same extent from these kind of wealth management um, uh, opportunities that, uh, that uh, the richest get. And again, this is uh, not to say that now everyone should have access to wealth manager, uh, rather it is to say that um, what needs to change, and again, I'm kind of going back to this issue of, of policy, is you know where those investment opportunities uh, lie, and um, if if they lie in the financial markets, then we need to ensure that the way that those markets are structured is more transparent, is more um, um, competitive in a sense that it is less dominated by few players. And therefore, that uh, you know, th those type of solutions, in my view, cannot be sold by just people becoming uh, more informed, or, or you know, the government providing some training or financial education. Uh, this is something that requires uh, broad regulation, that requires um, a certain kind of even struggle of interest or a struggle of power between the, those different agents involved, um, and this will not happen without a um a more even like ideological change which again you know I, I i i'm fairly pragmatic person so you know i don't say that we need to change the system and everything will be solved because it's not so easy to change the system but uh we can, just to to give an example that's not fully related to that but even what's going on in the us uh, these days we see the type of policies being implemented follow a very different ideological foundation compared to the policies of the time of financialization. So, you know, it's not that you need to change the system to make these things work, but you do need to acknowledge those kind of um, political interests and power and imbalances that uh, are, are, you know, at the back of these unequal processes and uh, implement policies that would then facilitate more people to, to get access on the same terms um, to those markets and those investments uh, that currently are only enjoyed by, by the largest uh, agents in the market. Perfect, yes. Uh, yes, I agree. As you said, there, there should be a limited access to those uh, 
maybe investors uh, or an access to someone who can really advise them well. Uh, but uh, something you have said since the beginning of the, the slide presentations, if I got it right, uh, there also should be a refocus on other ways of investing uh, other than financial instruments. Is that correct to assume? I mean, it's. I think it's an interesting point um, because uh, something I've I, I, I've been um, listening on recently, a bit randomly to be honest, is uh, and something actually an interesting case study. It will probably will surprise you, and I'm saying that. But um, Islamic finance actually, it's a very interesting case study because, um, of course, under Islamic finance, it is prohibited to um, earn and money through interest. So let's say any type of financial investment that we are talking about are not allowed. And so this doesn't mean that now there is no financial in, uh, investment in, in this type of an approach, uh, but there is actually a range of different alternative investment strategies that uh, they explore in this area of Islamic finance that uh, I need to admit, I'm not terribly, you know, I'm not an expert in this by no means, but I've been just kind of eavesdropping on some of the studies and research that's been going on. And uh, it actually opened my eyes quite a lot to the fact that, you know, from the individual perspective, there is actually, uh, you know, a lot of different avenues of, um, of, you know, the type of investment you can undertake. It's not just about investing in financial markets. You know, you, you, you may invest in actually, you know, different type of um, different type of investment and it was actually crucial here and I, I think that's something I haven't mentioned but it is very much at the core of everything I've talked about so far is that what is very important especially from the point of view of you know more individual investors is to be able to diversify your portfolio meaning to be able to own a lot of different type of investments so rather than invest all your money in one type of investment um, experiment uh, you know, by different types of investments, some more risky, some less risky. And, uh, you know, this is very much a principle that, um, again, depending how risk averse or uh, risk uh, friendly an investor is, uh, does, it is a necessity to keep that portfolio of investments as diverse as possible, uh, because this ensures that, you know, any type of economic shock that will happen, uh, today or tomorrow or 10 years time uh, will not completely wipe out those those gains that you get from investment and again just a very quick example of this housing that I already mentioned um, housing was one of you know the major investments that many people uh, undertook during that uh, period of before the financial crisis um, happened and if housing is your only asset when the crisis hit, then the home gets repossessed and you're left with no asset at, at all. And so it's just, again, further emphasizes the need, even from the more individual point of view, like you and me, uh, you and I, uh, to ensure that if we want to invest and if we want our investments to be successful, uh, it's not just about you know what type of investment we make, but how many different type of investment we are able to get to, to make a, the most out of the funds that we've got. Okay, uh, so as you said uh, earlier in this presentation, this is a very broad topic and we, we would have much more to, to talk about. Uh, but to conclude our conference, I would like to bring you to two final questions, uh, more like personal questions and a way to intertwine uh, everything we, we talked about uh, so far. And the first one is, uh, do you think there really is an opportunity for everyone in developed countries and what would you say imminently needs to change? So to the first question, I'd say unfortunately no. And um, the, the reason is that the way uh, that the, the economy operates uh, still very much uh, provides more uh, opportunities for some through either their social class, their, their, their gender, their race, their, um, their type of employment, their occupation, uh, the type of neighborhood they live in, uh, the type of uh, you know, uh, you know social circles they have, um, all of that you know is something that is very much uh, impacting different people to a different extent, and uh, and so um, I, I yeah unfortunately I, I I don't think that the the type of 
economic model or growth that we've experienced over the past uh, few years and the type of policies that were implemented really helped those that needed, the, needed it the most. And in terms of what needs to change, of course, access is important. Access in terms of uh, being able to afford a good education, for example. You know, you cannot, even though I, I have argued that you know, education is not the main reason for unequal opportunities or, or inequality, it is nevertheless, uh, you know, a very important, uh, very important factor that prohibits many people from from accessing better, you know, opportunities. Um, housing, access to to secure, affordable. Uh, housing. It's again another crucial issue that unfortunately, as I can definitely tell in the country where I'm based in the UK, it definitely remains a challenge and uh, a big challenge at that. And you know, the type of house you live, the type of neighborhood you live in uh, will impact hugely on the type of opportunities that you that you get. Uh, but ultimately, I think what needs to change is uh, the, you know, the, the way that the, the economic, especially macroeconomic policy operates. And um, the, the, the example I can give is that, you know, even when in studies that, that look at that, even when we control for education, even when we control for occupation, certain people still have much lower uh, outcomes, much worse outcomes. Uh, on account of, for example, you know, the, the discrimination of their gender or race or social class. And so in, in my view, the best kind of the most feasible uh, change that we can implement, you know, soon to make things different is to, um, to revive that role of the state, to bring back the state to, to become more active in terms of investing directly in employment, investing directly in, in people, in, in providing those basic services like education, like housing, uh, food security, you know, all these kind of things that have become uh, sources of one of some of the sources of inequality and to therefore, uh, forget or, or not forget, but to um, do away with some of the uh, debates that have been, you know, constraining that more active role of the government. For example, the fear of public debt, the fear of government deficit. Um, it's, it is changing, and, and I gave the example of the US earlier, because I think it is really striking to see those type of recommendations actually being implemented somewhere in the world, uh, you know, as we speak, but nevertheless, in many countries, and again, I can give the case of the UK, the European Union as well, uh, um, you know, the ECB, uh, the European Commission, you know, it is still very much of the view that, you know, the, uh, there is a limit as to how much government investment can, uh, can help even now those opportunities and ultimately, you know, if there is an equality, then then probably it's how it's supposed to be because the market has decided this way, but it doesn't have to be this way. And I think for that, the most important change uh, would be to rethink fiscal policy more specific, more more urgently, but other types of economic policy as well to make sure that the state is once again more active in supporting um, its its uh, residents. Thank you very much. Just to finish up, because you you brought brought up something very interesting uh, that we should bring this uh, the state back. And uh, one last question: uh, Do you think sustained economic growth and uh, social justice measures, uh, or an increase of uh, social justice measures, uh, is a trade off or should be considered a trade off? Um, for my my expertise, no, absolutely not. Um, I don't think you can have. Uh, Good, sustained economic growth without taking care of the those who are left behind in society. And again, um, this uh, you know this comes from my my understanding of the economy as being driven mainly by by the demand side. So if people in the economy don't have enough means to to purchase you know the the the, the goods and the services that are taking place, then the economic economic growth cannot be sustained. And uh, vice versa, you know, I, of course, there's a whole issue. We're not talking about just the environmental considerations, which is again for another another topic for another day. But at the same time, you know, we do need some type of um, economic growth uh, generated somewhere in the economy. I'm I'm not saying specifically where it should be coming from. 
but uh, we do need some, uh, you know, some uh, uh, some growth to, to some extent to be able to uh, generate those resources that can support those left beh behind. Having said that, just a final kind of caveat. Even let's say in the current situation when the growth levels are very low due to the pandemic and due to all of that's been happening in the context of financialization, there are still massive resources that are untapped that could be used to support those left behind. And I'm talking here about uh, you know, the fact that many types of wealth, many types of incomes are actually not taxed uh, due to the different legal you know, arrangements and loopholes. And so there is this whole debate about, you know, actually there are resources out there already. Uh, they're just accumulated by the very narrow group of people who are not actually paying their dues on those profits or on those wealth holdings uh, through the taxation. So uh, my own view would be that the priority these days should be on uh, social justice rather than growth, because after the previous crisis, we prioritized growth over social justice, and uh, it hasn't uh, led to any sustained improvements. And so I think, well, I don't think there's a trade off. I do think that in the present context, we need the policy, we need to prioritize social justice over and above economic growth. Okay. Uh, so with this conclusion, I just want to thank you one more time for your input in the topic. And uh, thanks once again for accepting the invitation and for all the time spent with us here today. Uh, and you'll be joining our, our Economics Week uh, last conference uh, to close the week. And uh, thank you once again. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much.